When it comes to recent changes to the NAR Code of Ethics, a lot of questions remain hanging about its enforcement and its application. One vocal critic of the changes has been Rob Hahn, the man behind Notorious ROB and managing partner of 7DS Associates. He's been in favor of NAR adopting something similar to the Canadian Real Estate Association's Conduct Unbecoming Clause. So we invited our friend to the north, Tim Hudak, CEO of the Ontario Real Estate Association, to talk more about conduct unbecoming and how Canada enforces its members' professionalism. Listen up as we unpack recent examples that could put NAR's code of ethics to the test. Rob, let's start with you. Sure. Um, you have been somewhat vocal, as you tend to be, about the code of ethics, but really before the change that NAR was seeking last year. So That's right. Give me kind of the headline on what your perspective has been around the code of ethics over the last several years, and then also kind of what your takeaway has been from the recent change. Wow. Okay. So if we're going to go back to the beginning, I mean, the issue for me has always been the code of ethics is outdated, right? That we, it's, we've been a victim of our own success. You know, like when you think about the code of ethics, when it, when it came about, it was in an era when there was no government regulation, there was no license law, right? But yeah. after we got there, and you and I have been talking about this for years, Emily, one of the issues that I've been pointing out for years is the fact that you can't, it, like I've asked every local state, you know, leader, right, of realtor leaders, like what does the code require that the law does not? And the answer is not a whole lot. So, you know, we've, I've been trying to be like, hey, can we, can we do something more on the code, right, instead of just relying on the law? So that's kind of the background you know, of the overall thing, because I believe that the code is, is what makes a realtor a realtor. I'm a firm believer in the realtor movement. <clears throat> but, you know, the, to me, the twin pillars have always been government advocacy and professionalism, right? So in that context, like, yeah, there's aspects of professionalism that are super important and protecting the realtor brand. So when the speech code came about, you know, my thing was, I, I knew and, and I think I've been proven right that this was going to cause massive division within the realtor ranks, just given the society we live in today. And I thought that was a better way of trying to get to what I think the committee and NAR wanted to get to, which was protect the realtor brand and increase professionalism. Because it's certainly not professional for a realtor to be going on social media or wherever and throwing out racial slurs and epith you know, like that's not professional. We get that, right? But just given the environment we're in, I just thought this is going to create a lot of division. It's going to make half the realtors feel like they're targeted. And, you know, what I put out there, you know, in the very beginning was there's a better way, which is the Canadian code of conduct, you know, the uh, conduct unbecoming clause, mm -hmm. you know, which we discussed, you know, in the past right, when we were doing some of that. And uh, yeah, and, and AR didn't really adopt it. And I just thought it's time to, like, I know time was short and I didn't think it was going to go, you know, too far, but I really wanted leadership to at least take a look at that, that as an alternative to creating 10-5 and some of the changes that, that they did in fact do. And I thought it was simpler. I thought it was more elegant and I thought it was more effective. And the benefit was that we didn't have to speculate on how this was going to work because CREA you know, Canadian Real Estate Asso Association, our sisters to the north, had this in place for years and years. So I felt like NAR could just reach out to them and say, how did this work right, for you guys? And then see about implementing that. Because I did feel a lot of the stuff that the 10-5 changes were trying to go after would have been covered under Conduct Unbecoming, you know, without pissing off half the realtor population by making them worry that if I'm a Christian, if I'm a Republican, if I'm a Trump supporter, suddenly I'm gonna get targeted. It's like, no, none of that is conduct on becoming. But yeah, posting up the N word on Facebook is probably conduct on becoming a realtor. You know what I mean? There's not gonna be a whole lot of disagreement. Anyway, that's the so brief background. That that's think, why I'm so vocal about it. Fair to say that you think that 10-5 is polarizing because of the way that it was articulated and that the the boundaries that it created, whereas it could have been broader and still accomplished similar outcomes I with think regards so. to the types of behavior it wanted to curtail. I think so. And then, so Tim, you're living with what Rob thinks might be awesome for us. Uh, is it awesome for you? What, what, how does the conduct unbecoming work in Canada? To what extent is it actually leveraged? Yeah, look, probably is that in, in pieces. And Emily, thanks for having me on Scratch Time. It's great to see you. Thanks for your leadership. 
Of course. And Rob, this is fun to talk about this with you because you were kind enough to invite me to a, a session you had in Austin. My first trip Where to Austin was 2017. Here in right? Austin, Texas. <laughs> in AR code. You, right. you kind of got your way a little bit, right? Issues that, that <laughs> you were talking about three years ago are uh, now on the radar. So um, I'm a big fan of Rob's. He's been kind of speaking at our conference. I enjoy his stuff. And I know he's made the case book uh, conduct on becoming here in Canada. So the, the caveat I've got for you is it's not really been tested out that much. So quick story, it actually was put into our uh, CREA, our Canadian Real Estate Association, that's a Canadian NAR equivalent, uh, in 2015. And Canada is a beautiful country, lovely people, I love it. We tend to be a bit more dull than the Americans. So we didn't have the same sort of impetus you did. Back in 2015, there was a story about a realtor who was throwing trash on the lawn of a competitor. And that offended us as Canadians trying to be good neighbors and polite and all. So this is one of the reasons they got moving in 2015 uh, to impose in the code of ethics this notion of conduct unbecoming. It was meant as a catch-all, a, a general approach to issues that would take down the realtor brand in the eyes of realtors and the general public more importantly, but was not related to business matters. So not as, as a incendiary beginning, that's what is imposed. Here's the catches. Um, number one, until this past year, Korea was not able to enforce it. It was in the realtor code, but it was enforced uh, locally uh, instead. And truth be told about that too, it really has not been uh, enforced very well at a local level, maybe with a couple exceptions in the Western part of our country. So while it's there, it's meant as a catch-all, it really has not been tested that much. <clears throat> yep. And I, you know, since you brought it up, Tim, I didn't want to, you know, I'm all about confidential. So I didn't want to talk about the three year ago meeting, but you know, if you remember that? when we were talking about it around then it wasn't the, you know, obviously we weren't dealing with some of the political social divisions. And I, what I remember us talking about was there have been a number of instances in the U S where a realtor was caught having sex with some mistress or something, you know what I mean? So, a paramour in an empty listing. <laughs> it was like, it's not against the code. We just, it's not precisely legal, but boy, does that look bad. You know, it's, and it was that I remember us talking about, you know. So if we moved beyond the trash man. So there are some. So here's an example. There was a, a murdering realtor. I don't know. I should be careful on how many people he actually was alleged to have murdered, but murdered. And before he go to trial, um, nothing could be done by the regulator. He had right. not broken, found guilty of any, right. any laws. Uh, and as such, you know, the board locally faced, well, can we actually get this guy uh, out of our uh, board and take right. away his ability to be a realtor? So there's an example of how it actually was utilized yeah. uh, here in Canada. It's a good example. And whereas so here we had a... Question, uh, yeah, but my ahead. question on that correlates back to, do, do you have to leverage a, a code of conduct to assess who gets to be a part of the club and who doesn't, right? Like at the end of the day, it's it's really your decision who gets to be a member of the association and the terms of that membership that they have to adhere to. What it, um, you know, some of the some of the things that we've done in an as an association are just to open our arms so wide that everybody was welcome regardless of what they stood for. And maybe the question or the reckoning that we're having now is, should that be the case? And do we have to use a code of conduct to make those decisions or should we be having different um, manners of establishing what membership should be? Where's the bar? How do we establish that? I don't, I mean, it seems like there are other opportunities for a mechanism around this. If the goal is we only want the best and brightest, we don't want the murdering realtors, we don't want the ones throwing trash on somebody's lawn. That seems pretty straightforward. That's not necessarily though, Rob, the intent of the code changes that were made last year, which did Correct. directly correlate not just to this massive conduct that might not look good to the public or damage the realtor R, but very specifically issues of hate speech and racism mm -hmm. in America. Yeah. So how do we do both is maybe the question for you guys. Tim, let me start with you. So conduct unbecoming um, can be managed through the code of ethics, but how might we also manage that kind of conduct in other ways as associations? Well, you can always raise educational standards. You can make it more difficult based on past behavior to qualify for a license uh, in the first place. You can make it more expensive to, to have a license. Uh, I'm sure there could be other mechanisms of uh, self-censure and such, but I don't know, Emily. I, I just think you need to have a, a playbook here. I actually think 
that this is the right thing to do. We're facing it here in the province of Ontario, where uh, we have a code of ethics uh, in legislation, and we're renewing that. So we are looking at uh, of the conduct unbecoming. Is that the right approach? We are looking at what the NAR uh, is doing in our consultations with uh, government on, on that. But yeah, I think you actually, I, I, I can't think of a better mechanism than having a, a set of rules that, that are clear. There should be a high bar for this. So it's not used to, you know, grind axes and go after your competitor down the street. Yeah. And obviously it should be a decision-making mechanism of people who are respecting the profession. But honest to God, I do think it's time that realtors did a better job here in Canada, and you're on this in the States, of self-policing. You can't always slough it off to the regulator. Regulators too often don't know the business, certainly know the history in Ontario has been too often a slap on the wrist for various reasons. And I can't imagine, you know, let's think of an airline that says um, that, you know, use that old uh, few rotten apples mechanism. You know, we, our, our pilots are really good, except for the guys that crash in the mountains from time to time but the rest are all right. Now, you, you can't use that approach in the modern era. You gotta be angry and you gotta give the boot to these people that had this egregious rule breaking. Let me understand what you're saying though, because you said both were working with legislators, with regulators to determine how to manage licensees and their behavior, but also we should be self-sufficient on that front and creating accountability in our marketplaces as associations, correct? So it's a yes yeah. and? So uh, the situation I'm trying not to get too much into the weeds here. Sure. So a regulator cannot enforce anything that is conduct outside of the business of real estate transactions. Right. So we are now moving towards giving them that ability as well. And nationally, Korea is looking for an enforcement mechanism so we can self-police much better right across this country. Okay. And so Tim's bringing up a part of what the changes that resulted from last fall were that were so, so controversial for us, Rob, here in the States. To what extent does behavior of a realtor apply when it's unrelated to a real estate transaction? We now know that there are aspects of the code that do apply outside of that, but that for some reason was very upsetting to many, many people, despite the number of leads they've curated at soccer games on a Saturday. So help me understand where's the line between when we're doing business and when we're not in your opinion. I, I don't think it's even that that's uh, the problem, right? The problem is you can do whatever the hell you want as a realtor association, right? Mm -hmm. Now, again, I don't know, I, I don't recall like the Canadian charter or anything like that, but fact is we can't have the licensing authorities here do any, anything with hate speech, right? Because of the first amendment, you can have NAR, which is a private organization do whatever the hell it wants, right? So yeah, I mean, the issue though there is the MLS. Mm -hmm. In other words, if, you, if the MLS were completely separate from realtor membership, so realtors can say, you know, we don't need a code. We could just say, we don't like you, so get out. You can do that. I mean, there's nothing that prevents that. However, you can't do the same with the MLS because the MLS has been found over and over and over again as a necessary utility to do business. So if you're going to take away somebody's livelihood, then yeah. you do have to meet, you know, some, some bar, right? It can't just be arbitrary, right? Otherwise you just get sued and then the DOJ will come in and all kinds of nasty things will happen. So the only way to do it, I think, is through, like Tim said, real clear rules, right? Where people could say, oh, if I do this, then I lose access to the MLS. If I do this, I lose access to the MLS. And I think that's what we're kind of dealing with here, right? And so we could even like the whole thing about private versus personal, I, I, I kind of feel like when it comes to private organizations like realtors, yeah, you can do whatever you want. You know, I don't, I don't have an issue with that. And quite frankly, I don't know that the people who are really upset with the decisions necessarily have a problem with that either. The problem is the multiple listing service, mm -hmm. right? So we go down this path and, and I've already made this prediction, right? You know, I, and I grant to, all my predictions are guaranteed wrong or your money back. But, you know, but I do think, you know, uh, and I've been talking to a lot of people, you know, since this past around the country privately, because they're all terrified, right? It, and I think there's a really good chance that we see a real schism, you know, within the realtor movement sometime this year. And I think the schism will manifest via the MLS, right? I mean, we already have the eighth circus of the Thompson States, right? And then we have California, where you can't tie realtor membership to MLS subscription. Texas is not one of those. However, given kind of the general social you know, and political environment in Texas, 
if a realtor were to bring a lawsuit in Texas court saying this is discrimination, this is antitrust, you know, I'm, I think it's pretty likely that they win that, right? Yeah. Um, and I, I think, and this is my fear with all of this is, is that that's what we're headed to. We're headed towards schism. I don't want to see the schism. I think there's so much value to kind of the realtor movement as a whole, but it is what it is. And, you know, so now it's a matter of can leaders really deal with this? And, you know, like the Jenna Ryan situation you guys have in Dallas is going to be the first big test of how realtor leadership deals with this. To be clear about you guys, that's not my guys, <laughs> as that's not my membership. We're that's based right. in Texas, however. <laughs> but you guys meaning, you know, like realtor, but, all, all but of you us. You guys as in friends and colleagues that are having to wrestle through the questions that are being raised by by the conditions that we're in today. And, and those yeah. are fair questions. I think what, what you're really speaking to though is that we can't have it both ways in terms of association and MLS world. Correct. They are different entities. They have to be treated differently. And the un, the uh, decoupling of the two is probably more important as it relates to this topic than any other. If we truly seek to hold accountable realtors, yeah. capital R, with some level of standards that are in excess of everyone else, then it can't be an association for everybody. No. Meaning we can't necessarily continue to tie access to the MLS as it relates directly to that. That will That's be an right. unpopular opinion probably even among my own leadership potentially, but there is a, there's a direct concern there that if yeah. we want to be better, then we can't be for all. And if we can't be for all, then we can't tie the utility to that any longer. Correct. Correct. Um, and for me, that's really the big the <clears throat> reckoning that is coming for us is how do we continue to decouple association from the operations of the MLS well, in a way I mean... that's successful for both. Well, Emily, you know, you know, I've been writing papers. I've been talking about that for seven years. So that's not the topic for this podcast. Not today, but look at how quickly it takes us back. I mean, it, it does. It speaks to the dysfunction of the way that we've been managing the two yeah. for a long time, potentially. Yeah, yeah, and so, I think we're going to see everything come to a head sometime this year. I, I actually believe that. Right, right. So, so you spoke a little bit of of a realtor member to the north, Miss Jenna Ryan, who participated in an activities at the Capitol that have been shocking to many of us, but. Rob, I want or uh, Tim, I want to ask you this: um, If that had happened in Canada, and there had been insurrection in the way that we experienced it, and one of your members had participated in that, would the conduct unbecoming apply in that circumstance? Yeah, I, I, I'd say yes. Uh, I can I can clearly see that um, taking place. I mean, Rob's recent column makes a, a good point that you know did she crossed the line when it came to hate speech, discriminatory speech. Did she incite insurrection? All that doesn't look like she actually said anything. But the conduct itself, my guess, Emily, the mechanism we have, that she could be uh, called up on that mechanism um, for sure. Right. Yeah. And so, Rob, whereas you sort of said, I don't, you know, my, I, I, let me let me try to recap a couple of the things that you're saying. You're saying that the way that we've gone about what we did last fall will create schism. It will polarize because of the politics associated with hate speech, frankly, and, and racism at this point in the states. Um, and that if we were to approach this with conduct overall, mm -hmm. we our umbrella would be bigger and we might be able to manage even more wrongdoing that could negatively impact the public's perception of realtors. I think we, yeah, I think we would impact more of the conduct. Uh, we would, there might still be some disagreement, right? But, you know, it doesn't, on its face, there's nothing objectionable about it, right? Mm -hmm. So take the Jenna Ryan example, right? Look, uh, if you showed up at a protest waving a Trump flag, that is not conduct unbecoming. If you then <laughs> break the law and invade the Capitol, I think even the people on the right who are Trump fans might go, yeah, that's a, that's a step too far. That's, a, that's where you cross the line. Do you know what I mean? Whereas with something like the speech code, and keep in mind that we have to put this in the context of the society as a whole, right? Every time that something like the, even the phrase hate speech comes up, like in America right now, that is a political topic. You know, that there's disagreement to the left and the right on what hate speech is. Is there such a thing as hate speech? So it naturally makes half the realtor population just go, whoa, you know, this is targeted to me. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. And I think with the conduct I'm becoming, you remove that, you don't say to the conservative, you know, religious, whatever realtors, you know, we're targeting you. No, no, we're targeting everybody who behaves in an unacceptable manner. And it's the focus on behavior, not 
the content of your speech, whether it's about protected classes, whatever. So the, I guess in a simply put, if you as a realtor go on social media and post a bunch of F-bombs and, you know, whatever about a fellow realtor because of some business disagreement, I think most of us could look at that. That's not professional. That's mm-hmm. conduct unbecoming. It has nothing to do with race, gender. It has nothing to do with protected classes. It's just behavior that makes all of us look bad so, versus what we have. Right? Yeah, but so an extreme example like that, I, I can understand. But I think even with the existing changes that were made, which are defined in federal code, you know, acts of hate speech are clearly defined and can be trained against to some degree. I've, no, I don't believe so. hate speech cannot appear in federal code because of the First Amendment. But the, well, the protected classes can be- Protected classes, is, yes. What is subjective is defining, is it hate speech mm-hmm. or regular speech around <laughs> those protected classes? But there's question there even of how are we training the panels that will have to manage these- Correct. Sanctions? How, you know, are people really prepared to put the guardrails up they're, around they're that? Not. They're can, not. In Canada, so. to what extent, I mean, how are you training people to determine what's unbecoming and what's not? It, that's even even more gray than the territory that we're in right now. Yeah, it's true. And this is our weakness. So we, we took the first step in 2015 to put this into the code, but it has been poorly um, managed as since. Now, there are some new cases coming up. If you want for a future podcast, I'd, I'd recommend Edmonton out of the province of Alberta. They seem to be the leader in actually enforcing this aspect. But broadly and across our country, it's poor. Let, let me add a couple of thoughts to uh, what you and Rob were just discussing. My understanding is that NAR did consult uh, with uh, Korea to see uh, how the conduct of becoming um, was working as an oh, option. Good. Ultimately, uh, NAR though decided because the nature was happening in the States or around speech and racism, they decided to uh, act, they needed to act in that direction. But I, I do worry for you, I think that is too narrow. Now here's another kind of soft Canadian example. It's not storming the capital, but very recently the province of Nova Scotia, it's like Canada's main, uh, we had a realtor who stole a dog. She thought a dog was being mistreated uh, by uh, by its owner, and she refused to get the dog back. Um, was not a client. There's no uh, real uh, real sorry real estate relationship. Um, but she did say that she knew some stuff about his listing, and she would use that against him if he complained. Cool. So here's an example again, something that would not be caught up in speech, but that's embarrassing behavior. The regulator here did act in the province of Nova Scotia, but as a slap on the wrist. So Walter's saying, "What the hell? This is extremely embarrassing, threatening people." So our unbecoming will capture that, Oops. whereas your speech code would not. I, uh, I mean, if only our problems were so simple as to relate to stolen dogs, we would really, <laughs> yeah. I, I envy the experiences you're having uh, up there, Tim. It sounds Canadians rough. Canadians are nicer. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we're so close yet so far apart, yeah. <laughs> really. But, but it, it is, it, it's interesting to think about how, how wide the umbrella could run, how, um, how significant even very small actions are when it comes to retaining the public's trust in the profession that we represent um, and the relationship that we share with the public. Tim and, and, and Rob, too, tell me, how do you think the public perceives the changes that are being made? You know, w- what's the conversation like with a consumer at this point? Should we be touting that we're doing this and we're proud of ourselves for doing it? Or um, what do you think their perception is of these changes? Tim, you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, so uh, my, my usual, I'll, I'll answer it a different way. My usual gut on this is a consumer will be widely um, unaware this is taking yeah. place and you can tell them all about it and why not, but it, it probably won't penetrate. It, usually the bad news travels, right? Bad news travels around the world before good news gets its pants on as the expression goes. Mm-hmm. But let me give you some contrary examples of risk of not of not doing this. So, you know, another example close to home, I, I spent 21 years in public life as an elected representative here in Ontario. And we had a case of the dog punching vet. So local veterinarian was taped by his staff physically abusing dogs, including punching in the face, claimed that the country he came from, that was common practice, which was ridiculous. Um, the disciplinary board went after him, gave him a slap on the wrist, and the Veterinary Association was nowhere to be seen. Uh, they didn't even do the few bad apples thing, they just totally disappeared, which was outrageous, which made me suspicious of that profession altogether. And that was such a huge story um, that, uh, that people then would lose faith in their ability to self-regulate. Even worse, we've had a series of stories in the province of Ontario, chiefly out of the Toronto area, our capital, uh, where they have what's called passing the trash among teachers, where teachers who had uh, caused sexual abuse 
uh, to their students would simply be passed on sight unseen to a school, you know, down the road. Mm. And they were never brought up on charges by, by the union or sadly, effectively by the regulatory body, which absolutely undermines their ability. What does that mean? Well, the, the profession's in disgrace. People will generalize that this is happening more often than not. And it will invite further government intervention into day-to-day -day business. I think um, my take on it is pretty straightforward. Um, depends on which consumer you're talking about. In other words, realtors aren't the only people that are divided. The people of the United States are divided. So take Texas, right? Mm. I mean, in the Dallas area, I, and I've seen these comments, right? You know, people on the left are saying Jenna Ryan's a traitor and, you know, whatever, and we'll never do business with her. On the flip side, you've got half the country. Jenna Bryan is a patriot and, you know, I'm going to make sure to do business with her. I, it's, so when it comes to something like this, there was a story in um, Real Clear Investigations. I don't know if you saw it, but it's, it's essentially a center-right, you know, media source, right? That's talking about the NAR speech code and how this is, means NAR has gone woke and it's become a social justice uh, entity. Half the country is going to look at realtors then and say, that's terrible, right? The other half of the country is going to look at them. That's wonderful. Like, and they're just doing the right thing. So in a real way, by going down this road, I think it's inevitable, right? That there's no, we're caught between a rock and a hard place. Realtors can't, at this point, I don't know how you get around that or until the mood of the consumers themselves change. So we get to a point where 90% of consumers, you know, just everyday people go, yeah, you know what? We really need to stomp out hate speech and, you know, et cetera. Then, yeah, I guess this is fine. But if it goes the other way where 90% of the consumers actually like, no, this is an infringement on freedom and this is too much. And, you know, I, then we got a problem. So to me, it's very similar if you want to do the analysis from that standpoint to kind of how the NBA handled Black Lives Matters, mm. right? When they went and did the, the jerseys and the kneeling and, and all of that, like, yeah, some part of the countries thought that was wonderful. It was such a great you know, expression. But at the same time, we, we all recognize a bunch of the public just said, I'm never watching the NBA again, all right? So I feel like, yeah, maybe it's not gonna get traction. And I kind of agree with Tim in the sense that most people aren't going to pay attention to this, except that the United States right now is so heavily politicized, so mm -hmm. divided, and the two sides do not watch the same news. We don't follow the same media. And I'm constantly shocked because I'm, I am on the right. And I look at, I talk to my friends who are on the left and say, so we don't like, I don't watch MSNBC. They don't watch Fox. You know what I mean? It's just, we don't follow the same news. So what some people might say, this is no big deal. It's not even, you know, blipping the surface of consumers. I'm like, I don't know if that's true. If you watch this side of the media, it's very much in the consciousness of consumers there. So it's, it's just a major concern, whichever side you're on. Do you know what I mean? At some point, when you look at it as realtors as a whole, industry as a whole, we don't deal with this division in some way. I, I don't, you know, schism seems like the only possible outcome. But I think that's true even had we adopted a different, even had we adopted conduct on becoming. It, I, I mean, there would still be the same kind of divide potentially around actions taken related to individual conduct that might be perceived as politicized as well. I, I don't, I mean, um, I would say this, I, I don't, I don't think we're here to criticize what's been done as much as we're saying, what do we continue to do? And then exactly. even as we continue to expand opportunities to increase professionalism, I think we run the risk of that schism again and again, because that's just where we are culturally right now. Yeah. Like I said, I mean, we won't know because it's, it's been done. Right. But yeah. I guess from my standpoint, uh, it was by not having it facially, like prima facie, you know, just on the surface, right? Seem one way or the other, mm -hmm. right? Which is why I really love the Canadian Conduct Unbecoming Clause. Now, you're right, Emily. In certain cases, application of that rule in a certain market could become political. It could become all those things. But with something like Conduct Unbecoming, you can point to actual conduct that's egregious. Do you know what I mean? So if, even if it's... Yes and no. I mean, I, you know, there are things that I think are very unbecoming that <laughs> might not be perceived that way or things that are very unprofessional in my book that might not be unprofessional in yours. I can't imagine the task of training against that, the grievance panels and the professional standard 
folks that would have to work to determine conduct at large, what is professional and what is not. I've seen some things in my time in this business. And right. it, you know, if we can't manage that at a human level, I'm not sure how we manage that through a professional standards process. I yeah. actually think it's not as difficult as you imagine, right? Because again, the conduct on becoming clause in Korea talks about egregious behavior. Tim, how hard think, is it to define egregious? Well, you don't have to define it. That's what I'm saying. Like, here's some interesting, Americans want to define stuff like down to like, you know, we don't have to, like, we can actually land the judgment of rational people without special training. Seriously, if, I, if, if you had a, a, a committee of say five realtors, right? Mm -hmm. Without any special training. Yeah. And we went to them and said, listen, uh, this realtor was caught on camera having sex in an empty listing. Do you guys think this is conduct unbecoming? I think the answer is going to be pretty clear. It, Do you know what I mean? I'll hey, agree with that, but how many actions are there where there are circumstances that could be perceived as politically driven right. or are politicized? And right. then how do we train against those actions? But that's what because I'm saying. To your so, point, Rob, you hear the news one way, I might hear it a completely different sure. way. Facts are not facts here sometimes. Sure. sure. But my point is, I think most, the vast majority of situations, hey, this person broke windows at the Capitol and, and stormed in. Well, that seems like pretty reasonable to say that's conduct unbecoming. This person was waving a flag, put up a post on social media saying, I support, you know, Blue Lives Matter. That, that does not seem like conduct unbecoming, right? So the issue becomes local enforcement of local realtors without any special training to say this conduct was no good, this conduct was good. Now, are there those gray cases in the middle where you might find you know, say Austin's super liberal, right? So, you know, your board might say, hey, what you did over there, that's conduct on becoming for us, get out. And could that become an issue? Mm. I guess. But you know what? That's going to happen with this code, right? With this speech code. Because you're going to have different local enforcement, as Tim pointed out. One of the biggest issues is how do you enforce this? Yeah, you I know, think so I feel like, yeah, it's the same problem. Greater more vulnerability to, to be a... It being gamed in the states, no doubt, particularly uh, around um, religious beliefs and, and political beliefs and the environment that you're you're in. The experience in Canada has has been has not been triggered that much. Uh, Rob's right; it does use the term egregious behavior, anything that is considered disgraceful, unprofessional, or unbecoming, right. uh, and it's egregious, you know, under the circumstances. And you tend to have then, you know, respected uh, members that sit on these panels who will adjudicate these matters. So the, the experience has been actually to have fewer than more. I think that speech policing will result in more. The same types of using regulatory barriers as going after your competition. I think you're far more vulnerable there than, than conduct uh, unbecoming. The last thing I'll say on this too is the experience of Canada so far has been, it tends to be an add-on. There will usually be other behaviors that would take place uh, during real estate transactions. And this gets to be an add-on. That, mm -hmm. that tends to be the pattern of those cases that exist. Until the, the dynamics in our country shift in such a way that not everything is as politicized as it is today, mm -hmm. I think we've got an uphill battle and a lot of this is going to remain muddy. What else can and should we be doing to increase professionalism and the public's trust in our, in our profession then? What other options do we have if all of this is quite challenging? I mean, you know, we talked about this, I think, three years ago. I and mean, one of the issues with professionalism and public trust is the realtor associations are super secretive about ethics charges. Uh. Right? And even ethics punishment, right? Like, it's not like I could go on ABOR's website right now, click on blacklist, right? And here is a list of realtors who've been disciplined by ABOR for an ethics violation, right? There's nothing in the record. You know, it's not like I could say, you know, hey, let's look up the Better Business Bureau for Realtors and see, you know, is this person have a clean record or not? We don't do that. So right off so, the so bat- So transparency in the process would, would definitely provide for public trust. I would think so. I mean, if, if that's our goal, like how do we not tell the public, here's, you know, here's how we discipline our own, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, it's, we do it, but then it's all secret. It's all kind of inside baseball, right? Mm -hmm. so Even that's, though that's, the regulatory agencies, that's the case. Tim, is yeah. that any different in Canada for you? Yeah, I, I can't speak to the American experience. I'm sure it's different across the 50 states, but here in Ontario, our, our regular needs strengthen. There's no doubt about it. I, I happen to be the guy that brought that legislation through when I was- <laughs> Yeah, you're the one for that. <laughs> I was ahead of its time in 2002. Um, but a big charge we've led successfully with the current government uh, is to give a greater ability 
uh, to suspend, revoke licenses. We more than doubled the fine. They can do proactive investigations now, set a higher bar to get in the profession, um, to have a small uh, administrative penalties as well, so you don't spend as much resources going after the bad apples mm -hmm. as you could for simple tickets. Right. So we've, we've actually brought that forward, which I think has raised the level of esteem for realtors, certainly with government decision makers and then those that follow uh, in the public. I think Rob makes an excellent point about the, the secret nature. I mean, it's, it's hard even on a regulator to find who have had transactions or sorry, have had transgressions. We can do that similarly. I think you had to hold brokers accountable, too. We've all heard stories with a realtor who gets in trouble and then she finds you know, refuge at, uh, at some low life brokerage. Right. So shouldn't brokers also be responsible for the conduct of their agents? Yeah, that's an interesting one, though, and sort of stemming from what Rob is saying as well. I've heard from so many brokers that even they are not always aware when an agent parted ways with their previous firm under terms that were less than awesome. And so it's transparency in their recruiting process as well would be beneficial because they wouldn't pick up agents that maybe had acted in ways that they don't want um, in their firm or they're, are not conducive to their brand. So I, I think that there's plenty to be done in terms of how we how we publish potentially, you know, the actions that are being taken and the records of the agents that we that we work with and manage and highlight, frankly, the those that are truly professional and are excelling. I mean, I, I would love us to find the carrot too for this and have right. the opportunity to really highlight the good work of so many members that we represent. And I would bet that Tim feels the same about his agents. Yeah, right. that's an outstanding point to celebrate those successes, those that are, you know, extraordinary, they're charitable giving that are solving problems uh, in their communities that rise occasion and you know lead leading boards like uh, like austin's um and yeah we just have operating from principle um that is just too far too easy to get in and far too hard to kick somebody out when they break the rules and we're making progress by sticking to that and going hard at decision makers on that principle i think that's a that's a great place for us to kind of wrap up with with the expression that, you know, we're in the mud and we're not going to get out of there very quickly. <laughs> We've got a ways to go. I think that um, all of us will continue this conversation in some manner as we continue and, and hope for less divisiveness in our future. That would be beneficial for everyone, I think it's safe to say. Um, with that, I want us to wrap up with a few fun questions if you're open to it. I usually do a speed <laughs> round at the end of Scratch That these days. And I can think I was going to say, Emily, given the topic we're discussing, boy, fun seems like. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to go. We're going to do it. You know what? You're going to bring a little joy even to the even to the mud. So, so uh, Rob, let me start with you. What's your favorite podcast? My favorite podcast, uh, Industry Relations. Okay. Oh, really? You had to it's promote your own podcast. Second me. Come you know. on, Rob. There's no pitching here in, on Scratch That. <laughs> um, what? After that, uh, honestly, it's got to be uh, uh, Dan Carlin, Hardcore History. Okay. Huge fan. All right. I'll take that one. What's your favorite city that you'll travel to after COVID? Oh, boy. Or maybe during COVID, if that's your choice. Uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Charleston. Get back to the South. Um, and what book should everybody be reading right now? Oh, I don't know. That's pass on uh, pass to Tim and let me think about it. Get back to you. No, actually, you know what? I take that back. Uh, everyone should be reading The Daily Stoic. Okay. All right. Why? I think we all need to embrace a little bit more stoicism in our lives. You know, the philosophy of stoicism. Even that is ironic reading, coming from passion. you, Rob Hahn, but I appreciate that. <laughs> what you're perpetuating these days. Tim, what's your favorite podcast? I'm not a huge podcast guy. So I guess anything, I'm a fan of The Ringer. So anything that comes out of The Ringer, I love the sports, culture, and politics for that. Okay, love it. Um, what city do you want to travel to when you can travel again? So we would split. I, I mean, I love coming to the States. We we're actually were in Charleston last year. I've enjoyed my trips to Austin. So I got three answers. I would choose Chicago. My wife would mm -hmm. choose New York City. And if we had a compromise, we have good friends in Vegas, plus Rob and Sonny. So Vegas would be on the list. Yeah, Vegas, Vegas for sure. Uh, and what book should everybody be reading right now? I'm, re I'm reading Hillbilly Elegy. I, I'm a huge oh, yeah. fan of uh, Tom Wolf, And since he's passed away, I'm trying to find somebody who helps capture you know, what's going on in the culture. So that's Vance and Hillbilly Elegy would be my recommendation. I love it. Um, you guys are awesome. I so appreciate you being willing to talk about a conversation that will go nowhere to some degree because it's difficult to talk through. But I know that uh, we'll, we'll get to the end of it at some point. And I really appreciate you taking time with me today. Thank you. Great Thanks. to see you again.